All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Really excited for today's event. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, some of you may not be familiar uh, with the Mosaic Arctic Expedition, but this exped or this uh, event today is in partnership with Reach the World. So Mosaic, or Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate Expedition, is an international team of scientists who intentionally lock the icebreaker polar stern into dense winter ice and will drift across the Arctic polar region for an entire year. They'll be conducting research. They'll also be navigating the challenges of resupplying, maintaining morale in 24-hour darkness, and keeping their equipment functioning in sub-zero temperatures for over a year. Now, every month, uh, we're, we're, we get to connect with different um, scientists, different explorers, uh, artists, uh, video, video filmmakers, you name it. We get to connect with them each month after they finish their leg uh, on the expedition. So today we're really excited to be joined by Amy Richman and Katie uh, Gavinis. They're fresh off their leg of Mosaic Arctic Expedition and they're going to share their experiences. Uh, Amy is a documentary filmmaker who spent time filming all aspects of the expedition and Katie is from the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies and spent her time on the academic Federoff icebreaker as a communications and outreach specialist. So Amy and Katie, it's so great to have you both joining us live today. We've got an awesome group of classrooms joining us from across uh, North America, both on camera and via YouTube. And I believe Katie, you're gonna kick things off for us. Yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen with you all here in a moment, but it's really nice to have you all kind of together digitally and I'm excited to share with you a little bit about the Mosaic Expedition and kind of what my role on it was and then excited to hear from Amy and then really looking forward to your questions. So let's see if we can get this to work. Uh -huh. Can you all see the beginning of a PowerPoint? So far so good. Yeah, we just need to go full screen. Okay, I'm going full screen. Maybe, there we go. Um, so as uh, Joe said, my name is Katie Gavanis and I work for the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies in Homer, Alaska. And our my main job is to work with teachers and classes and after school programs and take kids outside. So I, I basically teach science outside and I was incredibly lucky to be able to go and participate in the first part of the Mosaic Expedition. Um, and to learn about the Arctic science that is happening there. And just to give you all an idea, if you aren't familiar with the Mosaic Expedition, uh, we left from Norway and there are actually two boats involved in leg one, the main vessel, the Polar Stern, which Amy will talk a lot more about, I'm sure. And then a second vessel and we headed across, we headed east and north across many time zones um, and ended up uh, sort of stopping fairly close to the North Pole and then the polar stern is frozen into the ice and is drifting with the sea ice. And then the vessel I was on backtracked all the way back to Norway. Um, and the vessel I was on is, was the Russian icebreaker, the academic Fedorov. Um, so it's a big, big, big boat. Um, if you have a uh, football field at your high school or at your elementary school. This is about one and a half times as long as a football field and about half as wide. So it's a very big boat and it's uh, like something like 12 stories high. So um, major undertaking. And we had two main jobs. This is the Polar Stern. So on the Fedorov, actually, I guess we had three main jobs. The people who were on the Fedorov were helping the Polar Stern to find a big piece of Arctic sea ice that would work for mooring the Polar Stern to, that would be kind of durable enough um, for that to be their home base. We were also exchanging a lot of people and supplies with the Polar Stern. And then the third thing we were doing is setting up what's called the distributed network. Um, so the star in the middle of this graphic represents the polar stern and then every triangle and circle and square represents a place where some sort of additional science equipment was set out onto the ice. So it might be 
a buoy that's just tracking where the ice is drifting, just like a GPS sensor, or it could be a really complicated oceanographic instrument to measure temperature and salinity, how much salt is in the water, and um, all sorts of other things, or measuring aspects of the atmosphere. And so uh, this was a lot of work to get the distributed network sort of set up um, and involved many, many, many people. Uh, just to give you a sense of what life on the ship was like, this was my bunk. Um, this is when we were headed back south, so we didn't get this much bright sunlight most of the time. Um, and I'm sure Amy will be able to show you some really cool pictures of um, polar night and videos of polar night. Um, most of the time was pretty dark or close to dark while we were up there in the central Arctic Ocean. But as we headed back to Norway, we got really bright sunlight streaming through our window. There were three of us that stayed in this bunk room. And overall, there are about 60 people uh, involved kind of on the science, education, and journalism side of things. Um, so we were kind of the science expedition participants on the Fedorov, and that switched out. Um, so there were about 40 of us that kind of stayed on the Fedorov the whole time. And then every two to three weeks, 20 people moved from the polar stern to the Fedorov and back again, um, potentially back again. So the group was kind of always shifting. And then there are also about 70 crew members with the Russian vessel itself. And they were responsible for driving the vessel and cooking the meals and keeping it clean and all of the behind the scenes work, flying the helicopter, um, all of the behind the scenes work that made the expedition possible. We uh, had a lot of downtime while we were getting out to the sea ice. And then also once we were out there, uh, there were really, really busy moments when you know almost everyone was out on the ice setting up equipment and then there were not so busy moments. So we tried to figure out a lot of ways to keep ourselves busy. Um, luckily, one of the uh, researchers uh, is excellent at yoga, so she, led some yoga sessions in a tiny, tiny room. Um, we played lots of cards. Someone uh, knows martial arts. And so he was teaching martial arts groups. It was pretty fun. Um, but the real work was when we were getting out onto the ice and setting up the research equipment. So in this picture, you can see the boat, the academic Fedorov. You can get an idea for how giant it is. Um, if you look kind of on the front, well, it's actually, yeah, the front left side here, you can see that there is, um, uh, it looks like a ramp, but it's actually a set of stairs going down to the sea ice. And there's lots of little dots down there and those are people. Um, so it's a really massive boat. And we used a combination of the boat and the helicopter to um, get all the scientific equipment out there on the ice where it needed to be. Um, a few sort of just, impressions from the experience and then I'll talk a little bit about the science that we were involved in. Um, we headed up to the Central Arctic Ocean right at September 21st or 22nd and so that's when things shift from kind of the summer season to the winter season um, and in the Arctic it's a pretty abrupt change. Uh, so this is right about when you go from the least amount of sea ice in the ocean to start building up that sea ice again. And it's also when there's a really quick shift from lots of light to not so much light. And so over the course of the next month, we got into not really seeing the sun rise above the horizon um, when we were you know, out and about. The days did not have the sun in the sky. Um, and Amy can talk more, I'm sure, about what it was like once it got really, really dark. Um, I headed back to Norway before it got really, really dark. But that was one of the challenges that um, the group faced. Um, the other was involved the ice itself. Um, so because that's the time of the year when the sea ice, there's the least am amount of sea ice, finding appropriate sea ice that was um, strong enough to set the boat up next to and to take people and equipment and snow machines out on um, ended up being pretty challenging and in some ways, a little bit tougher than the scientists thought it might be. Um, here's a few, just a couple more pretty pictures. This was the last official sunset, I think, that we saw before we headed south again. 
Um, and then another really incredible part of the trip, but another big challenge were the polar bears. Um, so pretty early on, uh, mama polar bear and her yearling cub uh, started to pay quite a bit of attention to the polar stern and to the Fedorov and were very curious and were hanging around the ships. And this ended up causing lots of challenges for the scientists around the polar stern because um, these two bears sort of followed their ship into the sea ice to where it was moored and then were very curious. And so a lot of work had to be done to keep everyone safe and to keep the polar bears safe. Um, and it involved bringing people off of the sea ice pretty frequently to let the polar bears kind of move through and scare them off. Uh, and then this is, these are a couple pictures of ways that we tested the ice to see if it was thick enough or ways that the ice researchers did. So on the left-hand side, there's a big helicopter and you can just barely see at the bottom there's some piece of equipment on the deck and that is a way of they fly the helicopter with this cable down towards the ice and it drags this thing that looks kind of like a um, like a torpedo through the air above the ice and that helps them to measure how thick the ice is and then the other thing that the crew of the Fedorov did was if they found ice that they thought was good they would hit it really hard with the ship and if it broke it wasn't good enough. <laughs> because it had to be, even the ice we were setting up, these out kind of outer range of the stations um, had to be thick enough to be able to support a bunch of people and the equipment that we needed to use like these snow machines. Um, so it was really important to test it and figure out how thick it was. Um, but it was surprising that it actually, how how little ice you actually need to put a snow machine on. Um, so if the ice is about one foot thick, that's thick enough um, to be able to put people and snow machines that weigh hundreds of pounds on, which I didn't realize that it could be just a foot thick. Um, and then once people were out on the ice at those sites, the work really began setting up all sorts of different scientific equipment like I said, measuring all sorts of things about the ocean and the air and the ice and the things that live there in the Arctic. And this was really hard work and um, lots of different people were involved and working together to set up all of these different ways to take the temperature of the air and measure how much water is in the air and the temperature of the ocean and the temperature of the ice and all sorts of different pieces to, of information that are coming together. And sometimes, this meant, this is one of my favorite pictures, this uh, young scientist had to pull out the manual because we were working with all sorts of different types of equipment. So sometimes even the really incredibly smart researchers had to do their homework and, and read up on how do you put this thing together. Um, so to, conditions were tough. It was cold and um, windy. And so we had to you know, be real careful. The stairs going to and from the boat were slippery. And um, so we had to wear special clothing to keep ourselves warm and move really slowly up and down the stairs so we didn't get hurt. And then another key piece of safety were the polar bear guards um, that would go out. They were the first ones out of the out on the ice with the ice measuring team. And they would um, stand out there the entire time that people were out there to keep a lookout for polar bears and to help keep everyone and the bears safe. Um, which leads to the question, if, it was, if this work is so hard, why? Why do all this work and why send a random teacher like me, um, actually there are four, five of us involved, why send five teachers along or why send a video journalist along or why send you know, other journalists and artists along on this trip and why do the science in the first place? And the big answer to that question is that the climate is changing um, and it's changing fastest in the Arctic. Um, so this map shows the places in red have changed about four degrees Celsius, um, or sorry, four degrees Fahrenheit um, between 1970 and 2017, the average air temperature. So the climate is changing and it's changing fastest in the Arctic. And it's changing fairly consistently across the globe to be a little bit warmer or a way or way warmer than it was in the future in the past. 
And there's a lot of reasons um, about why it's changing, but the biggest kind of what it all boils down to is the greenhouse effect, which is sort of like a blanket that helps to, tr to trap heat near the surface of the earth. Um, and this is actually really important for life on earth, but our blanket is getting thicker. Um, and so that's causing lots of challenges around the globe. And that's the really big picture. But then when you zoom into the Arctic, Mosaic is trying to understand how all the different pieces of the Arctic system work together. So how does the ocean affect the sea ice? And how does the sea ice affect the air? And how do they all affect each other and the living things in the ocean and the humans that depend on the Arctic and the rest of the world. And so Mosaic is this attempt to bring all sorts of different scientists from all over the world to better understand what's going on in the Arctic because what happens there affects the rest of the globe and it's the place that's changing the fastest. Um, and two really quick pieces that I wanna share with you. The group that I was working with, I had the chance to go out and do some science and help with some science myself. And that group was really focused on the atmosphere or the air and the weather um, and the way that energy moves through the air. So kind of what happens to sunlight and heat in the Arctic Ocean. And so this group had a big, three big sleds um, that we put out on the sea ice and the sleds had a ton of different sensors on them um, that measured temperature and how much water was in the air. And then one of the big things that they were really interested in is how much sunlight is coming in, how much sunlight is bouncing off the sea ice, and then how much heat is being released by the sea ice and how much heat is being kind of bounced back to earth by clouds or other um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so there are a whole bunch of different ways to measure these and other aspects of the weather. Um, and then a piece that was really interesting as well was efforts just to better kind of understand the different living things on, the Ar on and around the Arctic sea ice and underneath in the ocean and how they interact with each other and how changes in temperature and sea ice might affect them. And the especially cool part I thought, and you, some of you may have already learned about this, um, but there's all sorts of different animals and plant-like organisms that actually live inside the sea ice. So there's a whole world of life inside the sea ice. And as that ice changes and gets thinner or gets less common, um, there's lots of questions about how these animals and plant-like things that live inside the sea ice will be affected and how that might ripple out through the entire food web and affect things like polar bears and whales and fish and people as well that depend on the Arctic ecosystem. And so my job as an educator was to learn as much as I can and then um, bring this information back to the students and adults that I work with in Alaska and also put together um, all sorts of different activities that can go around to learners and classes around the world so that we all can kind of learn alongside the mosaic scientists and understand a little bit more about what's happening with the atmosphere and the sea ice and the ocean and the life in the Arctic. And so with that, I will pass it along to Amy and then I think we'll do questions at the end. All right, that sounds like a plan. Katie, thanks so much for sharing your experiences. And Amy, I've just popped your microphone on. If you want to jump in and share some of your experiences from the Polar Stern, we're excited uh, to check it out. Okay, thank you, Katie. That was such a great, I'm so glad you went first. That was a great presentation and talking about um, just kind of an intro to what the expedition looks like. So what I want to talk about is since I am a documentary filmmaker, so I was on the German icebreaker ship Polar Stern to document the expedition. So I'm going to talk about kind of what that was like. So the first thing that I always think when I start any project is I always want to remember that there are always so many ways to represent something, right? No one person, event, or place is singular. And there are as many ways to visually or to represent something as there are people involved and perspectives. So let me pull up some pictures. Oh, it says I cannot start screen sharing while other participant is sharing. Okay. 
There you go. Katie stopped. I think you had to go. Okay, right. so first I want to read. Oh, there's no way for me to. Okay, well, first I will. Um, I will just read some of the. So the first thing I did was I wanted to find out what the scientists who were there, how they would describe the Arctic. And so I asked all of the scientists on board to describe the Arctic, and the answers were so different from scientist to scientist, which was giving me a sense of how many different ways there are to represent the people and the expedition. So one person described the Arctic as um, based on its geography and its size and like the territory and all the countries and people that live in the Arctic. Um, another person described the Arctic as a big vast ocean dressed in white. Um, another scientist um, described the Arctic as a homesickness. So he said, while you think that it's cold and it's white for him, it was so far away from home that when he described the Arctic, he described it as a feeling of homesickness. Another scientist um, described the Arctic based on the quality of light and said that it was incomparable to any other place in the world because of the light. Um, another scientist said that it's one of the few places in the world where she feels like how small she is compared to how big the world actually is. So for her, it was a feeling of being small. It was a feeling of scale. Um, another scientist um, said that the Arctic is a gateway to understanding other planets in the solar system. So this scientist studies extreme environments on planets like Mars. And so he looks at the Arctic as a gateway, as an analog to help us understand what life or what the environment in the solar system could be like because the environment in the Arctic is so extreme. So I thought right off the bat that that was really interesting that some of the descriptions were based on smell and color and other descriptions were based on a feeling and a sense and other descriptions were based on size. So now I will jump back into the pictures. Um, is this a full screen? I think if you jump up to the top, oh, there we go. We got it now. Yep. So this is a scientist um, taking an ice core. And I want you to remember this picture because this scientist Rob is drilling an ice core. So he will get a cylinder like this of ice, and we will see this later in one of the videos that I show. Um, this is a picture of one of the first full moons in the Arctic. Um, this was at Balloon Town, where they were building um, the tent where the atmospheric balloon, Miss Piggy, as she's called, will fly. This is one of the most beautiful sunsets that I saw over Met City. This is the atmospheric station. This is at the dark site. So this is the eco team and they are, they drilled, you can see a hole in the ice and they are going to deploy a, a sediment trap which will collect um, sediment and water in the ice over in the water over the year. This is another picture of that. So because I am a filmmaker, but my assignment on the expedition was to film for a planetarium production. Raise your hand if you've been to a planetarium, if you've been in to see a planetarium. Yeah. So a planetarium is, uh, it's a dome. And so it's a very immersive um, experience in order to see footage. So when I'm filming, I had to think about how, like what I wanted to share and how I wanted to represent it. So all of these other scientists, they experienced the Arctic as a feeling, as a color and all these different ways. But to film for a planetarium, I wanted to film in a way that placed the viewer inside of the Arctic environment. And so when I was thinking about how do I visually represent not just the people and not just the Arctic, but the feeling of what it's actually like to be there. So here we have the ship and this is another full moon.
This is an atmospheric scientist and he's getting his harness out. And so he is getting ready to climb the tower. So that's him at the top with the polar stern in the background. So as Katie was saying, eventually the light did disappear. And so we were in what was called polar night. So it was pitch black out except for stars. And the light of the ship was the only light that you could see. This is the first polar cod fish that was caught on the expedition. And this is an example of how dark it actually was. Once you got far enough away from the ship and you had your back to the ship so you couldn't see any light, this was how dark it was and you could only see people because of their headlamps. Okay, so now I'm going to share some video. So again, keeping in mind that, oh, this is. So I'm thinking about filming as a way to vid, like, place you in the Arctic so you get a feeling of what it is actually like to be there. So this is a view from the Russian icebreaker ship that I took back, but you can see a really great example of pancake ice. So this gives you a feeling of what it was like to be on the ship. So I will play another video. And while Katie showed really amazing photographs of what it's like, so this is the way that I was filming to try and give you a sense of what it felt like to be there. So this is where, this is called the dark site. So in that picture where I showed you the scientists taking the ice core, these are thin sections. If you take the core and you slice it really thin and you put it under light, you can see the ice crystals. So this is actually ice, a thin piece of ice that was taken from the core. And if you put it between two polarizing lights, it shows the colors in the ice crystals. And that is a way that one of the scientists was using color in order to understand the crystal structure in the ice. So So at one point we turned off all of the headlamps 
and you couldn't even see the person like right in front of you. So different ice has different crystal structures. So new ice, the crystals and the colors will look different than older ice, which has a different crystal structure. So as we are out in the field taking ice samples, this is in the lab what the ice actually looks like if you want to look at the structure of the crystals. So what were some of the challenges that I faced? So it was fun for me as an artist to see the similarities between um, my process uh, using camera equipment and the scientific process as well. And we ran into very similar problems. So if the scientist's equipment would freeze or break because the temperature was so cold or there was so much wind or the snow covered the instrument, the same thing happened with my equipment. So my camera would get covered in ice crystals and sometimes it would get so cold that it would stop working. Um, other challenges on the ship when the ship was had its engines on before it locked into the ice, the ship was shaking and so the camera and the tripod was shaking also. And I asked the scientists if they experienced any problems with the vibrations of the ship. And many of them said yes, that their instruments were so delicate that because the ship was moving, it broke some of the coils. I even asked um, one of the chefs on the ship if she was running into any problems. And she said she was trying to make a souffle, but because the ship was shaking so much, it flattened the souffle, it didn't rise. So there were chefs, there were scientists, there were artists, filmmakers, and we were all kind of running into the same challenges um, with the environment, with the temperatures, with the ship. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I will show just one more video. All right. Well, as you're getting that ready, I, I think I love the way you shot that. The darkness, it just made the place look so big and expansive and almost like another world. Pretty cool. Yeah. Trying to make it show what it felt like to actually be there. So this was after a storm came and it cracked the ice apart and all of the science stations on the ice drifted from the right side of the ship all the way to the front. And in this video, you can see scientists who have to cross what is a crack in the ice or a lead, and they had to put a wooden board over the crack in order to cross it. And so here I'm standing on the bridge of the polar stern and I'm watching them. And the audio you hear is the radio because everyone on the ship who went out on the ice had to take a radio with them. And that radio would speak to the bridge. So the people, the logistics that were kind of keeping an eye out on the bridge knew where everyone was. Yeah, 
And so just within hours, the lead was opening more and more. And on the way back, they were concerned that they, the wooden plank would have fallen and that they wouldn't get back. Fortunately, that didn't happen. So this was one of my favorite places to hang out on the ship on the bridge because you could get a almost 360 degree view of, um, of the ice and of the flow so you could see the scientists going out. Yeah, so I think we can open it up to questions. <laughs> All right. Well, Amy and Katie, thank you so much uh, for both sharing your experiences. It looks like an absolutely incredible uh, journey that you both had. It is such a large scale expedition, unlike anything that's ever happened before. Uh, and we really thank you for taking some time to share it with our classrooms. And, you know, students, think about it for a minute. What it would be like for like three months to be living uh, and working in complete darkness. It would be pretty strange, but very cool. All right. Well, let's start meeting some of our live classrooms. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to go to uh, our first group. Mrs. Elder Rubino has some students hanging out with her in Boulder, Colorado. So I'm going to turn their microphone on. Let me track it down. There it is. How are we doing, boys and girls in Colorado? All right. Who's got a question for Katie and Amy? Hello. Clearly, the microphone's right up in the front. Hi, hi, hi. Monica, here, please. Hi, hi. Hi. Why do you like to go to the North Pole? Okay, so it sounds like he's wondering why in the world did you decide to go to the Arctic to go all the way to the North Pole? Well, I can start. I live in Alaska, but I live pretty far south in Alaska. So I know a lot of people who live farther north and who depend on the sea ice um, to travel and to get food. And it's a really important part of their life. And so the opportunity to go out even farther into the sea ice and go to the North Pole is something that seemed really cool to me to be able to be there and feel it like Amy said and then to be able to be involved with um, bringing some of the science and stories back to the people I teach in Alaska and around the world um, because the sea ice is pretty important to a lot of the people that I work with. I wanted to go to the North Pole um, because I thought it was such a great opportunity to visually document a place that most people will never get a chance to see. So the opportunity to take pictures and make a film and bring that back so that you can experience and feel what it was like to be there. Um, I thought that that would be a really, really amazing thing to be able to give back. Um, I was also thinking that perhaps the films and the video and pictures that I were taking might one day be important documents that historians and scientists use because the Arctic is changing so much that to be able to go and like document what it's like now um, so that we have those records, um, not just the scientific knowledge, but also like a visual documentation of what it looks like and what it was like before all of the changes. Um, started happening much, much faster. All right, great question to get us started. We're going to jump to Canada now, Stratford, Ontario. Uh, Mrs. Hutchinson's class is joining us. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Stratford? Good. What All right, we're ready for you. What types of animals are at the Arctic? All right, so what did you see? I know we talked a little bit about polar bears, but did you see anything else? Seabirds, maybe some whale action? What'd you guys see? So we did see um, several polar bears. We saw a polar bear with two cubs on one occasion. Uh, another male polar bear came by. Um, I didn't see an Arctic fox, but I heard that um, there were some people who were out on the ice that saw an Arctic fox that was 
um, hanging around uh, the central observatory. There was also in one of the pictures I showed, Anders caught a fish. And so there was the polar cod. Um, with the 360 camera that I was filming that I put under the water, um, I was able to capture a jellyfish. I think it was a jellyfish and it was glowing all these different colors that looked kind of like an alien. Um, so those are the those are the creatures that I saw. <laughs> Yeah. You, Katie, anything to add? Uh, on the way out and the way back, um, when we kind of got where the ice was thinner, there were a lot of seabirds that we saw as well. Um, but otherwise, for our group, um, mostly the polar bears and the seabirds, we the work that we were doing, we didn't get to go send anything underneath the ice to catch fish or to look at fish. So I was curious about what was there. Um, and we did see as we were moving through the sea ice and the boat was breaking up chunks of ice, we saw things glowing, tiny things glowing underneath there. So maybe it was some of the jellies that Amy saw. Very cool. All right, let's go back to Colorado. We have another class joining us from Colorado. This is Mrs. Taylor Strauss's group in Boulder. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing boys and girls? We're doing great, thank you so much. All right, who's got a question? Oh, okay. That's a good question. So they're wondering about global warming. Uh, did you meet any scientists who talked to you a little bit about how it's happening in the Arctic? So I actually asked the scientists whether they thought of themselves as climate change scientists. And they said that they considered themselves um, climate system scientists. So they were scientists that studied the Arctic climate system. And so from studying the Arctic climate system, they could see changes that were happening. We had one scientist who was an ecologist and she said that the microbes, like small bacteria, and that she studies, that she thinks that their life that within just the next 10 years, she will see decades of changes happening to their ecosystem. And so you have different um, scientists who are looking at different scales. Some are looking at a very small scale, some are looking at a really big scale. All of the data that the scientists collect will in the end go to a computer program for systems modeling that will be able to better kind of predict um, what kind of changes will be happening to the Arctic. And the scientists that study kind of why climate change happens or why global warming happens, they look at things called greenhouse gases. And so those are gases that are released by burning fossil fuels or burning uh, trees and lots of other processes. Most of them are coming from human processes. Some of those greenhouse gases come from natural processes, but when they get in the atmosphere, they act kind of like a, a blanket and they hold on to heat and they send it back down to earth. And so the more greenhouse gases that are in our air, in our atmosphere, the more heat kind of gets trapped around the earth instead of escaping into outer space. And so that's kind of the very basic why global warming is happening on a planet-wide scale. I'm gonna give a quick shout out on YouTube to some of our classrooms who are joining live. Big shout out to Mrs. Therian's group, third and fourth graders uh, joining us in Ontario. We've got Moberly, Missouri. We've got some students hanging out with us there at Mrs. Collier, we've got Mrs. Cook's group in New Jersey hanging out with us. We've got another group in Mulvane, Kansas, and then another group, New London, Connecticut High School. So lots of great uh, students with, hanging out with us today. Let's jump back to another live camera classroom. This time we're gonna go to Mrs. Russett's group, grade five sixes in Arn Prior, Ontario. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing five sixes? Hey sisters. Hey sisters. Hey, sisters. Hey, sisters. All right, we've got a question. Um, I have a question. Hi, that's yeah. your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, look at the camera. <laughs> okay, um, uh, okay. There you go, we got you. Okay, um, my question is, what, how, how do you keep your uh, supplies replenished? That is a very important question. 
Um, so supplies could mean many things. So for the instrument, for the scientists, supplies could mean batteries, it could mean headlamps, it could mean lots of things that could break that may need um, to be replaced. Um, supplies could also mean food, right? That's a very important one. You have to have enough food on the ship. Um, actually on my leg, uh, the, there was a container of food that didn't make it onto the ship. And so that was a logistical, everything ended up okay, but that's the kind of logistical things like down to very small details of planning. Um, so there are six legs of the expedition. So when the icebreaker ship brings the new crew, the new crew and scientists and takes the ones who are on the German polar stern back, that's when um, supply, like we, the ship gets resupplied with fuel, of course, food um, and other like equipment that may have broken that needs to be replaced. So ships will bring it out to the polar stone as it's locked in the ice. And when it brings the supplies, it also brings the new scientists and new crew for the rotation. And that happens five times. And one of those exchanges is hopefully happening, happened right. late last week or early this week that's been delayed a little bit. Um, so they're the end of leg two and the beginning of leg three right now. And one thing that was interesting to me is I think a lot of people focus so much on how to get things to the polar stern and I've been reading some of the updates for leg four and five and what the organizers are saying now is think about how to get things off the polar stern because the the boat is getting full of stuff because now it's on the third group of people bringing things um, and and maybe some things are getting left behind to be used at later stages of the expedition, but they're sort of running out of space on the ship for all of the different resupplied things that have been brought on board. All right, that is an interesting perspective to think about is not only do you have to get stuff there, but then you gotta get samples and garbage and all kinds of other things off. Very cool. Uh, Littleton, Colorado, sixth graders hanging out with Mrs. Grandel. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing boys and girls? All right, I see someone and we're ready for you. Research center ships away from the ship. Do you move it back or just leave it? Okay, so Amy, that might be for you. She's wondering when the research stuff shifted so far, what did they have to do? Did they leave it where it was? Did they move it back to where they wanted it? What did yeah. they do? So every, for on the, I was there September to uh, through December. And there were several times where, and mostly it happened when there was a full moon. And so the tides were pulling the ice apart. And so the, our flow, the piece of ice that we, the ship was moored to, and that all of the science was um, kind of built on top of, that ice flow cracked apart several times. And sometimes it would crack apart and come back together. And one event, we call it the event, it was the night of a really big storm and like it dripped, so the ice flow broke apart and it drifted. And so the first time that happened, um, a lot of the science stations were, they went to get them and they rebuilt them closer to the ship. The second time it happened, um, they left it where it was and waited for the ice um, to freeze back together. And I think they left it there. So there were several times when um, instruments went down and tents and the stations drifted away. On a number of occasions, they went to get them and brought them back. Um, I don't know what it is now, if it has happened again. So the answer is one time they did re went to get, get it and then reset it back up close to the ship. And then the second time it happened, they left it where it was. All right, great question. Uh, where do we need to go now? Let's go to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Uh, we've got Mrs. Van Mid hanging out with us. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Sault Ste. Marie? Good. Good. Decent. Decent, I'd say. All right, who's got a question? I do. All right, we gotcha. Okay, so how much knowledge did you know about the Arctic before going there? Probably not much. Yeah, that's, um, so I did a lot of research about 
um, not just the Arctic, but the science that was happening. So the scientists there are kind of looking at how the ice acts as an interface between the ocean and the atmosphere. So there's the atmospheric team that is studying cloud formation, particle formation, and how those particles become cloud seeds. And then that helps form clouds in the Arctic. Um, there's the ocean team, there's the ice team, remote sensing, remote sensing kind of studies ice thickness and snow from a helicopter as it flies over the Arctic. So I did a lot of research about all of the different science um, that was going to be happening and thinking about how when they look at all of that science happening at the same time, they'll get a better picture of the Arctic. Um, that being said, all of that information was very abstract and very conceptual. And so I was in my head a lot with all of that knowledge when I went to the Arctic. And it was only actually when I saw polar bears did the material um, kind of consequences of what the scientists were studying become very real to me. Um, so it was almost like I felt like I did too much research <laughs> and it was so abstract and just like in my head thinking about it, that it took polar bears and really thinking about what the changes mean and what in the Arctic and what those changes will impact and what life it will impact. And then once I saw the polar bears, all of that like conceptual theoretical knowledge about the Arctic just came back down to the ground. That was my experience. And I, um, like I said, I live in a part of Alaska that's outside of the Arctic, but a lot of the teaching and learning that I do is about um, oceans and kind of coastal ecosystems. So, and then I have done work with schools and communities and students who live in the Arctic part of Alaska. And so I had some knowledge about kind of the animals and the ecosystems and the changes that are happening in the Arctic of Alaska but I was paired with the atmospheric scientists and that's not an area that I have very much knowledge about. Um, and so it was really fun to learn kind of the bigger picture of what's going on in the Arctic and how the different changes that I've learned about before this are connected to those really kind of big systems and especially to learn more about the chemistry and physics of what's going on because I definitely uh, came in with more of a biology perspective and so it was really fun um, and challenging to, to learn some of those concepts and kind of tie it all together into a better understanding and one of the really fascinating things was how often answers to questions that I or others would ask the scientists where the answer is we really don't know yet there's so much about this part of the world and these really complicated systems that remains unknown and they're also changing really really quickly um, because of climate change and because of Arctic amplification. And so oftentimes, even if you do all your homework and, and learn as much as you can, there are some things that we just don't know yet. Um, and hopefully Mosaic will help to answer some of those questions. And it was fun to see the scientists learning about the other scientists' yeah. work. So, you know, the atmospheric scientists and the ice physicists, you know, they're so specialized within their specific um, field and specific uh, part of the Arctic that they're looking at, that hearing them like kind of learn about all of the other systems and other scientists' knowledge um, was, was fun to see how much they're, they were also learning on the ship. Very cool. So Mr. Jansen's class, uh, Mrs. Lada, they're joining us, 7th and 8th graders in Sarnia, Ontario. Let's get that mic turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Sarnia? Hello. Yeah. What is one of your favorite memories from this journey that you'll never forget? <laughs> so there's so many, but one of them that stands out for me was when I was walking on the ice and um, I had that realization that I was walking on an ocean and so that the ground that I was walking on was actually a piece of ice that was floating on the ocean. And there were certain points um, where you could feel the ice moving and you could actually, after the storm broke kind of the flow apart a little bit, you could, you could feel as you were standing on the ice, it was like drifting away from somebody who was standing on another piece of ice. And so I think when you're out there because it's so cold and because you're wearing all this gear and you're focusing on walking and I'm focusing on all my filming equipment and carrying tripods and getting things set up and not wanting to miss any moments that, and I think the same is uh, true for the scientists. They're so focused on doing the science and getting the measurements and making sure the instruments are working, that sometimes you can forget where you are. And so that moment of 
realizing I was walking on ice that was floating on the ocean and really feeling that was probably one of those standout moments for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And for us, we weren't we weren't out on the ice during any major, during or after any major storms. And so I never felt the ice moving actually, but the, the research equipment had GPS sensors on it. And so being told that I'd, you know, been standing next to this meteorological sled pretty much all day, you know, went back to the boat for lunch and came back out and then being told that it had moved, you know, 100, 200, 300 yards over the course of the day, when it felt like we were exactly in the same place the whole time was kind of um, mind boggling to me. And then I agree with uh, whoever told Amy that the, the light in the Arctic is a really important to them because that was um, just watching how the light changed and interacted with the ice and the clouds uh, was really a favorite part for me as well. All right, so I'm gonna squeak in one question from YouTube. Uh, to wrap up, this class is wondering, this is our group in Missouri, they're wondering how did you communicate with the mainland? What was the crew using to communicate to the mainland from the ship? So I was really excited thinking that there would be no communication um, because how often do you get to kind of go off the grid? There was, we didn't have access to internet, so no streaming Netflix or YouTube videos of any kind, um, but they did make email and WhatsApp available. So the scientists were able to um, kind of keep in touch with family and colleagues back home through email and WhatsApp. And I'm sure that the captain and, um, the uh, other crew on the ship had um, like iridium phones, so they were able to call if the signal permitted, sometimes it didn't work. And they may have had access to um, uh, internet and a bandwidth that as scientists, uh, we didn't have access to. Yeah, for us, um, the email was pretty intermittent and you had to kind of get it to one person who then sent it out. So it was oftentimes a one or two day lag time between when you wrote an email and it got sent out and then another one or two days before you got a response. Um, and so WhatsApp ended up being a pretty uh, pretty significant communication tool on board the Fedorov. Sometimes the email wasn't working at all. Um, and for a while they limited us to kind of one hour of the day that they turned WhatsApp on. And so it was a really strange going from, you know, no one, on their phones at all to like one hour where everyone was crowded around where the signal would come from. <laughs> um, it was very strange. Uh, and then they kind of opened it up more broadly, but it didn't work as quickly after that. Um, so it was kind of an interesting trying to figure out how much time you wanted in, to invest in staying connected and how much you just wanted to kind of set it aside and not worry about it. And I, as a teacher on board, one of my jobs was to be writing a journal every two or three days that would get published so that classes could read it and people could read it. Um, and so I ended up sending out a lot of journals via email, but I sent some via WhatsApp messages. So imagine writing, you know, an essay for school using text messages, basically. Um, and I sent it to someone else and then she would put it online. So that was kind of a funny process to be involved with as well. All right. Well, I want to start off with a huge thank you to our classrooms, both our classrooms tuning in live via YouTube, as well as the great classrooms who are on camera with us. Thank you for the awesome questions. And then I know there's more questions out there. So Amy and Katie, I'm wondering if classrooms have more questions, can they send them to me and I can forward them to you guys? Definitely. Sure. All right. Awesome. So boys and girls, both on YouTube and on camera, if you have more questions, send them to me. Uh, your teacher should know the email address to use. We'll make sure we get those asked. And then Katie and Amy, thank you so much for sharing what looks like just an incredible experience. Tons of memories are going to last you forever. Thanks for bringing those experiences back uh, to us here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share. All right, the last thing I'll do, I'm going to turn the microphones on. Boys and girls, you want to get a little bit loud, a nice goodbye and thank you, and then we'll sign off for today. Once again, thanks everyone for hanging out with us today. We have another Mosaic uh, event coming up on the 17th. I believe that's going to be 1 p.m. Eastern. You can find it on the website, but we look forward to seeing more of your classrooms 
uh, hanging out with us this month. So thanks again, everyone. Signing off for today.